is the Mindset Athlete Podcast, and I'm your host, James Roberts. I'm a two-time Paralympian and owner of James Robert Fitness, which is an online training, nutrition, and mindset coaching business. First of all, I'd like to thank Lauren Williams for suggesting this quote to the show. An athlete is a mindset. It's how you prepare, think, and execute. Not because of some elite status or physical stature. Anybody can be an athlete. By Chris Hart. And each week on the Mindset Athlete, we like to bring you inspirational athletes, a message, or experts talking about human optimization to teach you how to change your perception of your mindset and become 1% better. And on today's show, I've got David Bolasomi. David is a TCU alum, class of 2020 offensive tackle. Obviously, for those that don't know, so obviously it's Texas Christian University Horn Frogs uh, football team. And you have been described by Gary Vanderchuk himself as David discovered the game late, later than the than most. So it's so he's got so much raw talent. So obviously from some from the man himself, Gary V, that's probably a very uh, humbling, <laughs> uh, well, testimonial, however you want to put it. Yeah, he's absolutely. Big... It was it was very very humbling to be honest with you because I've been following Gary V since. I was a sophomore in college. So my senior year, when it was time to pick an agency, like it was, it was a done deal. Like as soon as they reached out and I was like, man, your sport, I was like, are you serious? Like, dude, like I've watched probably all your videos. Like, you know, so it was, for me, it was, you know, it was, it was very, I was very excited by it. Because I mean, I just, what he's about, what he preaches, right? Not only from like, obviously, like he's big on content creation, but just like, life how you go about life how you know like you put your head down and you just work you know and, and you know try to be good to people try to be good by people try to be good for yourself and that's the real you know that's how you define success not about how much money you have or lack of or you know things like that nature but you know how much you love to do what you do and that is just something that resonated with me from the very beginning so again like when it was time to sign i was just like oh i'm, I'm on board dude like <laughs> Like, you know, I love your stuff. So, David, talk to us about, obviously, you coming into the game of football quite late. Describe yeah. your journey but being different from other people. Yeah, absolutely. So, uh, I wasn't born in the United States. I was born in the Congo in Central Africa. And uh, the year that I was born in 97, there was a civil war in my country. So, we, you know, we had to flee the country. So, I was, I was born a refugee. And... Uh, we actually had to flee again from the Republic of Congo to uh, Togo, small country in West Africa. And that's where I lived for the first 11 years of my life. And again, as refugees. And then when I was 11 years old, we got picked by the American government through their reinstallation program, which is like they pick a certain amount of families from war-torn countries and then bring them to the United States for essentially a fresh start. So my family, is, my family was one of the families got got lucky to be picked when I was 11. And that's how we landed in a small town in West Texas called Abilene, Texas, which is like, I was always like, I, I grew up, Lome in Texas where I grew up for most of my life. It's a huge city. It's a city of like 3 million people. So like there's a lot, you know, interaction. It's just noise. It's, it's a lively city. And then to go from that, to Abilene, Texas was just a complete culture shock. It was, first of all, I cried on the entire flight here, right? Because, like, the only thing I knew about Texas was the show Dallas, and I was terrified of horses back then, so I thought I was going to have to ride a horse. So that, And then my mom played along with it, so it was just, like, it wasn't the right mix at all. But anyway, turned out to be an amazing experience for me. Met some amazing people down there. But, again, moving from Togo, to the United States, there's a bunch of things that I was introduced to, like American football. I, I didn't know the game existed until I landed in the United States. And <clears throat> obviously, landing in, in Texas, the first thing you see is, you know, the star, right, the Cabo star. And I didn't know what the heck that was at all until one random Sunday, <clears throat> I was uh, just watching TV with my grandmother and, you know, Sunday night football, and I happened to watch a game, and I was like, oh, this game doesn't make sense at all. This is not fun. You know, first of all, why is it called football? Like the football I'm used to, you know, people play with their feet. So it makes sense. So it was just, it was just a bunch of things. Where I was just like, yeah, like this game is not appealing at all. 
But, you know, fast forward, you know, I, mean, I go to school and all my friends play American football. And, you know, obviously I want to be willing to play with my friends. So I start throwing the football around and understand it a little bit more. But really didn't start really getting into it until I moved from Abilene, Texas, to then Texas, my junior year. And uh, when I moved in my junior year of high school, this big black dude, my, my, he eventually became my online coach, Coach E. For the first two weeks of school, will walk up to me and be like, what sport do you play? What sport do you play? I'm like, I don't play any sports, man. I just, you know, I go to school, make sure my grades are, are good. I go home, I work my, you know, my side job on the weekend. And then you know, that's all I do. He was like, dude, you're so tall. You have the you have the tools like you need to play you need to play. He did that for the first two. I kid you not, every day for the first two weeks. And I was like, you know, then I was like, okay, dude. Like, if you're gonna put that much like effort into talking to me about the same thing, what the heck? I'll try it. And I tried it. And my first practice, I was absolutely atrocious. I was horrible. Oh my gosh, it was just disgusting. And he pulled me into the film room and he showed me the film. And basically, he showed me that every single mistake that I made on the field was something that could be fixed as long as I was willing to work. And I've always been a competitive kid. I've always, you know, like I've always wanted to be the best at whatever it was, whether it was a school, whether it was project that I worked on, whether it was work. So the fact that I stepped on the field and I wasn't even remotely decent at all, like that pissed me off. I was like, no, like that's that's not okay. That's that's not the standard that I live my life by. Like I need to be good at this. And you know, again, I bought in, I bought in 100%. I dove in, I dove, you know, straight in. I literally, from the standpoint where I was like, okay, I joined the team and I learned the game of football, all I would consume was NFL Network. I work out like two or three times a day, just absorbing the game. And that's how I grew to love football. I grew to love football by learning football. Like, literally, all I would consume was NFL Network, ESPN, watch film, watch old film, watch – old lineman film just like from the 60s and just see how like the game progressed and like why like and that the reason I love football now is because of like all the things that that's like football is like a chess match it's like you know people see the hitting and like obviously that's sensational that's what sells seats but it's, it's a game of chess it's about you know looking like trying to find the little holes that you're putting in it's just like seeing it from like basically taking myself I'm just seeing it from like a holistic point of view I was like oh like this game is beautiful like it's amazing how and that's that's how I grew to love football and then yeah I played my junior senior year my senior year I was blessed enough to have you know a bunch of division one offers and then I picked TCU and you know I've, I've been there for the past four years and now I'm done. So out of curiosity David mm-hmm. why be, being born in Africa why have you got an Italian sounding last name? <laughs> that is funny because you're definitely not the first person to say that. And to be honest with you, I have no freaking idea. No, no idea at all. I mean, that's, you know, the last name of, you know, my father and his father before that. And I, I honestly don't know. Maybe, you know, I don't know, way back in the gap at some point, there was like, you know, some like, I don't know, like influx. And that's why I got my last name. But I don't know. Like, it's funny because like literally – uh. The first time I met the chancellor, which is like the president of our school, he was like, "Oh, I thought you were like an Italian guy, like <laughs> just looking at your name." And I was like, "Yeah, I don't, I don't know why." So obviously, moving from high school to the university, university of uh, Texas, Texas Christian University, I've yeah. almost dropped in the University of Texas by <laughs> accident. Uh, why did you pick that one over uh, all the other schools then? That's a very good question. So the recruiting process coming out of like high school, it's an absolute mess to be completely honest with you. It's, I mean, let me put you in the setting, right? So at the time I'm 17 years old, right? Okay. So obviously you have to sign this, you know, national letter of intent. I'm 17 years old. That means that it doesn't necessarily mean what school I pick. My parent also needs to pick the same school because she needs to close out because, again, I'm underage. So you have that. That's the first check. Second of all, in Texas, football is a religion. Like, it's, like, literally, like, I've been to mass on Sunday where, like, the 
literally the press was like, okay, the Cowboys are playing today, so we're going to like, you know, like fast track the mass so we don't miss the game. Just <laughs> that, and, and that's, you know, that's completely normal around here. And like you have high school stadium that are bigger than, you know, some stadiums in England. Like the high school stadium I played in is essentially like, it's the size of Wembley Stadium. Think about that. It's absolutely absurd. Anyways, it's a religion down here. So everybody has an opinion about where you need to go. So again, I'm 17 years old, right? So I'm this 17 year old kid. And obviously, you know, like you get all these division one offers and all these coaches tells you tell you the same thing. Like, you know, you're going to be treated like a son. Their wife is going to be like a mother to you. They're going to bake your brownies. This is the best place for you. And at 17, you don't know anything about anything. You just don't. Like, you know, you're, you're an idiot. Like, you, you're still a freaking idiot. And you think, you know, the world is this. And it's really not. And, you know, like, it's, a, you know, so you have all those things. And you have, like, I remember I used to walk into school and, like, Teachers walk up to me and like, they'd be like, oh, you need to go here. You need to go here. I heard you got this offer. Like, random people down the street will, like, come and, like, give their input. And, like, you know, and at 17, I was just like, and I, I couldn't necessarily explain that to my parents because, again, my parents are from Africa, right? All, like, my parents don't understand. Like, now they understand a little bit about football, but back then they didn't. They didn't understand any. They didn't understand the, you know, the recruiting process for them they only saw it from an academic lens, which was beautiful, right? Because when it came to, like, what I wanted to do on the academic side, I could definitely come to them and we could have a conversation about that and we could look at the pros and cons. But when it came to football, I just I couldn't, right? So, like, if I were to walk up to my mom, it's like, no, I don't necessarily think, you know, the scheme of, like, things I'm used to from a scheme perspective, that coaches, you know, we have the same philosophy on that. She didn't know what the heck I was talking about. Like, you know, like, who are going to be my line? She, she did not know any of that, right? So I didn't necessarily have that support, like, from that side. So, like, when it came to, like, talk about the football aspect of it, I, I relied a lot on, you know, what everybody else said because I couldn't talk about it back home. And it got to the point where it was just, like, it was a lot. And I remember it was one day I was just, I, I had enough. I was like, like, it was fun. I mean, like, it was humble, like, getting all these offers. But it came at a, it came at a cost, right? Obviously, like, everybody having their input. So, you know, I reached out to Coach E, you know, my online coach, and I was like, I need to talk to you, Coach. And pulling down in his office, and I was like, you know, explain the situation that I was in. And I, you know, bluntly asked him. I was like, you know, if I was your son, where would you have me go? And he said, TCU. And I laughed. I was like, what are you talking about? I was like, why would I go to a small school, like, in forward? Like, I mean, obviously, it's a division one school, but, like, size-wise, right, small school in forward Texas, when, like, I have SEC offers, I have SEC up, why? Like, why would I go there? Like, that doesn't make sense. Everybody tells me, you know, I need to go to the SEC because, you know, I'm a lineman, and that's what I'm in Britain. You sent me there, and you were like, first of all, you're not everybody. That's one. Two, uh, TCU is a great school, not only from the academic side, you know, the uh, influence that they have in the DFW area, but also their program, right? Like, you know, it's not to talk to me about Gary Patterson, right, the head coach at TCU and what the program is like and what the culture at TCU is like and how hard they compete. So just to not just look at the big names, but to give them a try and, like, just go visit and see what the heck is talking about. So I was like, okay. You know, Coach E, I mean, he's not – he's never led me astray. Like, he's always been – you know, he's – He's a very black and white type, the very blunt, no BS about him whatsoever. So I was like, if he says that, like, I have to at least go there. And I took a trip to TCU and I stepped on campus and it was it was a done deal. I was like, oh yes, like this is this is where this is where I'm going to be. This is where I'm going to be. Did you feel very much at home straight away then just on that initial visit then? I did. Like to be honest with you, I did and it's it was it just it's something about the campus and I there's some things you can't put in words and obviously it's different for everybody but I stepped on campus and I felt at home I really did I felt like this is the place where I want to spend the next four years of my life and obviously grow as a man grow as a person grow my intellect but also grow on the field it was just I, I don't know how to put it like I stepped and I'd like you know sometimes you just know and I stepped out there and I just I knew and do you think you 
un- undersold or underestimated TCU before you had that conversation with Coach E? That it, it, it was kind of, well, they are a underdog type, type of school anyway for people that don't yeah. don't know. They've kind of gone f- through the ranks. Uh, the, the uniforms, the, the experimenting with it is, 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 is playing around with it. But obviously that's to entice the yeah. younger generation to see, well, this is what we can do with with uniform combinations. And I, I watched one of your videos with the, the, it's hard to describe what color helmet. It's like a pinkish purple one. So it's yeah, very, so, yeah. very unique. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. We wore that against, uh, against Texas this year. Yeah. That was a, I love, I love that, that, that combination was really good. And like, you're absolutely right. Like the whole, you know, uniform thing is to like, it's sensational, right? People like gravitate towards the sensational. And obviously, I mean, it's a, it's a school that's known, you know, it's a, so blue collar school, and that that comes from you know the the culture and the mentality of the head coach Gary Patterson, right? So it's a school that obviously it's a small private school in Fort Worth, but you know we're a Division One school in the Power Five in the Big Twelve. So uh, like that just speaks to your you know the growth that he brought at TCU, right? And it's it's funny you know we talk to like past alums and people that play with him, and you know you don't realize that like 20, 20 years ago when it got to TCU, TCU was in the WAC conference, and I'm pretty sure you don't know what the heck the WAC conference is. Oh, no, I, just... I, do, I, I give some context for be it people, even though by my side of my voice, I don't. I, my father's side of the family is American, so I know exactly what you're talking about. Yeah, which is like how small, you know, how small of a conference that is, and how much growth. So it's been very blue collar. It's about work. It's about results, and you know, things of that nature. So obviously, like you know, from a brand perspective right like you know the big shot school like the university of texas they're gonna get more noise but like you know and that that's one of the reasons why i undersold you know tcu from the very beginning it was i guess name recognition wasn't as high as you know those big names out there but obviously you know competition wise you know the results speak for themselves and yeah that that was a big part of it and honestly going there is what like allowed me to be like whoa like you know, it's it's just it was it's just amazing. It was an amazing experience. Did you even know what a horn frog was till you got there? I had no freaking idea, no idea at all. And when I learned it was a lizard, I was like, first of all, this is <laughs> this is just too much. First of all, why is your mascot a lizard? And like, and then you learn the history of it, and like, you just learn. And then he was like, oh, wait, this whole makes sense. It's, now I'm a horn frog for life. And do you, do you think, obviously, well, I, I didn't know it was a lizard. I thought it was in the frog family. So I've, I've learned something new today as well. But David, be it from a lizard perspective, being able to change its, see if I can get this right, its spots is the, the saying, but do you think it bo- it goes well with, obviously, it blends into its surroundings? to be a school that is very much up and coming and will obviously punch above its weight. Do you think it's kind of, well, I'll fit in where it needs to be, but I'll adjust on the fly as well and be adaptable? Yeah, I think, you know, that's a very good question. I think, that's, ooh, I don't know necessarily know how to answer that. I I do think that in whatever situation, there's, there has to be some type of adjustment period. Because, I mean, obviously, it's not something that you're fully used to, right? And, but but then again, that's just part of life, right? What, what situation is thrown at you? And from start to finish, A to Z, 100%, you're like, oh, yeah, I was made for this. No, like, dude, you're going to have hurdles. You're going to have to jump through something. You're going to have to compromise some aspect of it. And it's just, I mean, it's you have to be flexible. And, like, obviously, you know, I'm, let me preface this by saying, I'm 23 years old and I know, you know, I haven't like, you know, lived life and all like, you know, my experiences. So again, take what I'm saying with a grain of salt, but I believe based on my experience that in anything that you do in life, you have to be flexible. It's, it's part of life. Why? Because like situations aren't fit fully just for you, you know, like, cause if they were, you wouldn't have to work for them. You know, that's why work comes into the process. And work is part, like, you know, obviously you're betting yourself, but you also compromising 
aspects of yourself, right? Because we're not perfect. We're human. We're flawed. We're full of flaws, right? From, from start to finish, right? So for you to make the best out of a situation, you have to essentially bend a little. And, you know, by bend, bending is good because by bending, you learn new things. Like, you know, like this idea of like, you know, I don't bend, I don't fold, I don't, that only works in like, you know, quotes on Instagram. Like what, what part of your life can you truly say you've never been there? Like, no, like, it's situational, you know? Do you think playing your position helps? Because ultimately, if the pocket implodes, you've still got to protect, be it, okay, I think the one that you did show was protecting the running back but your main objective is to protect the quarterback. So you think having that pliability, versatility, flexibility to a sense, if we have to give Mm -hmm. a little bit, and obviously this is very hard for non-Americans to understand what I'm talking about, but be able to go from a straight line to a U shape. Mm -hmm. And ultimately, if we still do our job, we've ultimately won that battle. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And it's, I say the one thing that playing offensive lineman has taught me is what servant leadership means to the team. Because that's what an offensive lineman is. It, it's a servant leader. Is you do the dirty work, you get no credit, and you're fine with it. And that's because that's that's the job that you have to do. And it's it's really it's it's a very interesting position, right? Because if we're talking about it from a like Every sport with a ball, right, that, that where there's a ball involved, it's the only position in all of sport where you have the, your back to the ball 100% of the time. Like, you literally don't see the ball, right? But you have to react essentially at the same rate as somebody that's seen the ball coming and put yourself fully in the way of the person that's coming and where the ball is. And it it creates like this. It, it's it's this weird sense. Is, you know you have to be offensive lineman to understand. It's just like the stuff that you have to do because your whole job is to protect. Like all of it is from start to finish to protect. It's not you know you're not scoring, so you're not getting you know those like sensational stats. You're not going to be on ESPN. You're not you you know you you do the dirty work so other people can get the credit and the team can win. But also to that, as an individual you don't matter. You don't, you can be the greatest right tackle on earth. You can be the greatest center, the greatest set tackle. But if the dude next to you is horrible, it does not matter. Like in basketball, for example, right? Like LeBron James can carry like his, you know, five person squad to, and I just do an, an, an amazing thing. And, and um, in football, Derrick Henry can break 12 tackles and like, boom, like score 80 yard touchdowns, right? He, he's done it. <laughs> but like as the office lineman, it doesn't matter. Like if you're like just this this absolute beast that's left tackle, if you don't have help, you will get you will get destroyed throughout like the tenure of a game. And it's like it forces you to like learn teamwork and compromise. And like that's why I say compromise because it's funny. Like <laughs> now I'm 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 currently working on 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 the startup, you know, with my uh my, my business partner and. One of the things, like, you know, we're having to hire a team you know, to grow the team out. And uh, on it, like, one of the things that, you know, uh, I talk to Trent about all the time is, like, the experience of leadership that I learned playing offensive linemen is very interesting because on the football team, not on the off, just on the offensive line, on the football team, you have 100, 115, 114 people, right? 114 essentially type A males. That we all, all of us think we're right 100% of the time. All of us think, you know, we're the best or whatever the heck we do. And none of us essentially want to compromise, you know, that big, by you know, macho. So it's like having to navigate through that and still be a leader through that. You, you, you learn to compromise. You learn, to, okay, like, this is tough for me to shut up in here. This is like, okay, this is how I go about this thing. And it's like, it's very raw, right? It's uncut. It's not necessarily, you know, like your typical, uh, what you call a cubicle type of, you know, workplace. And it's and it, it teaches you, again, like servant leadership. Like you, you do all those things, but you need to be fine with not getting the praises for it. And to tie back into like 
our, our original uh, when we talked talking about Gary V. One thing that resonated to me is, is that the same mentality. It's like you do all this work not for applauses, dude. You do it because it's good, because it's you know it, it, it achieves a goal, and you know like the panda keep moving forward, and that's what matters. That's the only thing that matters. Do you think that set you up for for good to deal mentally now and psychologically? to deal with this pandemic oh yeah absolutely absolutely I, th- I think it has i think it has 110 percent. because i think first of all and you know again preface this again i'm 23 year old i understand you know i have limitation to <laughs> things that I have experienced life but i really do think that you know like serving leadership is very important i think we all should have some aspect of it because it's it's not about us. It's really not like at all. And, you know, we, we interconnected. And if anything, the situation that we're in right now has proven how interconnected, how small the world is, right? Like a small virus that started on an 18 hour flight away. Like I went to China last summer to study there. I'm, I'm totally fascinated by China, just like from a culture to like the past 50 years, the economic jump, like I've heard articles on it on LinkedIn. It's just, it's, it's very interesting to me how big of the jump. And I'm actually, uh, I'm learning Mandarin right now because it's just, it, it's a very interesting country, right? So, uh, so an 18 hour flight away, which was honestly, I'm a six, seven kid. So like being in a plane for 18 hours is, is, is truly a fit. But anyways, <laughs> that's what, a virus that started at 18 hours, 18 hour flight away, put the whole world on pause. If that doesn't speak to how interconnected we are, that doesn't like, you know, I, I don't know, I don't know what else you need to see, right? Like how something so far away, something that you, most people have never seen been to like have impacted your life. And like we all interconnected. So I think because of that, we need to have some aspect of serving leadership. It's about it's about us helping each other. You know, it can't just be about me, 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 me. Because me, me, me doesn't work. It doesn't. It, it, I, I know shape of point, it doesn't. Like, the way you're able to live your life here has a lot to do with the way somebody else is able to live their lives there. Because some way, somehow, both of you guys living your, your life is affecting each other. So if we don't take ourselves out of the equation to a certain extent, and trying to, you know, engage in whatever, whatever it be dialogue, whether it be like, you know, you know, this whole trade talk for a trade or, or things of that nature, we're not going to work. Because at the end of the day, we only have one world, you know, that's, that's, that's the only thing we have. I know, you know, Elon Musk and his team are trying to find a way for us to live on Mars and we'll see how well that goes. But until, you know, you... <laughs> you're able to grow crops and I'm able to just, you know, walk out on Mars and breathe. We only have one plant. There's only one. So we need to find a way to, you know, cohabit. And I think that's where servant leadership comes, it comes in part. We need to have a certain aspect of it with all of us. Why do you think that people are so engrossed in the me, me, me kind of mindset mm-hmm. based on, do you think it's uh, too much of, a social phenomenon in terms of well i want to put myself out there and i want to be kind of liked as opposed to obviously the internal aspect of loving yourself irrespective of of social media i think that's a very good question well not to get philosophical but then like you know it, it comes like you know to like what is what are humans like what are we are we communal creatures or like do we take this idea of survival of the fittest to like the t of it like do we only care about ourselves and it's it's very interesting right so like uh Nietzsche is one of my favorite philosophers which is like very interesting because like when I think about like my valley like it just I just find what he says very interesting right so like when he says like you know man is a wolf to man but like is essentially a dove to himself that that's very interesting that's a very interesting concept and i don't necessarily think that i agree with that concept but you look at you know the world you look at you know like certain war starts you look at like you know um hyper consumption like and how you know that impacts us and things that we demand as you know as individual it's like it's very interesting right so like there's obviously some truth to what he's saying i think it's I think me, me, me culture derives from 
some aspect of that, you know, that as as humans, obviously you want to, you know, care about yourself first. But caring about yourself first, that's the thing where it's just a reality of the rest. So like one thing that separates human animals, because we are animals, from non-human animals is consciousness, right? And this idea of consciousness, consciousness is very interesting because consciousness is not something that you can easily define, right? So like that's one thing that, you know, like artificial intelligence engineers, are, they're trying to figure out because you can't, you can't just type in a computer. So like you can make a computer do a bunch of things. So like a perfect example is like chess, right? So you have computer programs, like computer algorithms that can beat the best chess players out there which is like, you know, make you think, oh my gosh, like this is so close, you know, what's next? But you essentially don't have an AI that can go pick up that chessboard, set it on the table, set every single piece so it can be played. So that just like, again, like think about, think about that. Something very specific, like as a chess, right? All the different, you know, like essentially in chess, you can have every single move can be the right move, right? So like, you know, from a computer aspect of it, you know, it's it's perfect for a computer. But the simple thing that a four-year-old can do in like picking up a chessboard, setting on the table, setting every piece where it's supposed to be, so then you can play, that computer has no idea what the heck is going on, which is just very, like, that's where consciousness comes into play. It's just, it's, it's the little thing. But anyways, the reason I bring that in is because part of consciousness allows us as humans to rise above, right? So like certain things that non-human animals would do, right? So taking care of uh, like, you know, the mentally ill and things like that. So like, you know, if it was purely love the jungle, every single uh, which, every single uh, child that's born out there that, you know, obviously can't fend for himself would get, would, get, would get killed. But as human, we're like, no, that's atrocious. That, that that child has value, whether he's or her's disability, and we're going to care of him, right? Again, that's consciousness. That's you, you know, putting yourself, you know, because if it was purely survival of the fittest, we'd throw that kid away. But we have come up to a point where we're like, no, that's, we're, we're not doing that. Like, we're above that, right, because of consciousness. So I think it's, you know, it's fighting, it's fighting those those human urges, right? Those like you know because because there, there needs to be limitation to man and that's why we have laws because laws are there to limit humans because humans need to be limited you know because if we all of us just go around there doing whatever the heck we want we, we won't be able to live with each other it's it's impossible right so there needs to be some aspect of the man i think that's where consciousness come, comes into play that's where you know values come into play that's where you know a bunch of things that are instilled in us so like you know be nice to your neighbor well, why do you need to be nice to your neighbor? Why? Because you're nice to your neighbor. He's nice to you. It makes it much more like, you know, uh, it's it's a better, you know, environment for us to live. And it just, you know, it trickled down to like certain things. It, and that's that's my hypothesis on it. Obviously, you know, I haven't tested it out. But that's why I think, I think, you know, maybe me come from the innate aspect of human that want to put ourselves first. But again, there comes a the question. If we're going to say, you know, we, we're, Obviously, we, we, we're human, we have consciousness, but then isn't it our job to rise above that to some extent? Yeah. Well, so, well, I think when you bring in the AI, David, I think obviously what the, the computer or algorithm does or any automation to that matter that yeah. people or businesses want to do because it's more convenient. Uh, yeah. And obviously you can turn over more speaking to more people but ultimately when it comes to the other end of it you need to be a little bit more of that human aspect because ultimately like you said a robot can't read or can't exhibit human emotions mm -hmm. yet obviously that would be very scary when it does happen <laughs> uh, but I think that is what people resonate with and and they and they're driven towards that individual because ultimately i will have a split second decision on whether or not i like you or, or i don't based on a not multitude of factors be it because um the one you did uh with uh, jonathan jones with off the ball with him asking the question of does your size and your height make people make pre predisposed assumptions of you 
the answer is probably I already know that is it is a yes because you are deemed as a threat to somebody else yeah. because you're imposing to 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 that I probably probably wouldn't but that's probably because I'm I, I've come from the sporting environment it's like okay you've got height and size over me whereas when you're whereas the weakness within within your Absolutely. within your skill set and I might look for that it's like okay I can't be you and all all, all these other tangibles but what where are you, where is the limiting uh, factor in 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 the makeup of you view as a person but I think obviously going forwards. I think it's remembering to, to, to tell people that it did ultimately. Yes, we probably need to step away from those assumptions because it's a bad one based on, well, I don't, I don't like you because you're, we talked, we talked a little about health and, and, and wellness before we start recording. You're going to have predisposed ideas of somebody that has their fat, even though you don't know anything about what's put them in that, into that uh, predicament. Ultimately, I've had conversations with people behind the scenes through the pandemic and they've made choices to maybe eat a little bit more because of boredom, a little bit of there's nothing else to do and grazing and not really being back to your point of the consciousness, not fully aware of what they're doing. So it's trying to, I think ultimately as co- as coaches and as people, life coaches, et cetera, and influencers is to get to know probably that person's psyche behind the, behind the eyes and to get to know the individual because ultimately you, like you said, you were with 113, 114 other guys. There's going to be bust ups at times in practice, but you have to coexist ultimately to win games. Absolutely. Absolutely. And that's, you know, I think you brought up a very good fight, right? It's like seeing past the facade, seeing past, you know, what the person looked like. And it gets very easy. And not just like from a physical aspect, but I mean, if we take it into um, things we do today, right? So you judge a person based off 140 characters. Like you have made a conclusion of a human being based of 140 characters and that's that's very very interesting and that's it's we don't know each other right so like and it's it's it's, i mean first of all it's on i've always found it fascinating right and and i guess part of it is i don't know maybe it's evolutionary right so like i guess you know, uh, at some point, you know, before modern technology and things of that nature, if you were to see some, you know, a being, you had a split second decision to, you know, uh, make a decision of what you were going to do because it was life and death. But again, things have changed. So again, it's a matter of like, you know, rising from that. But it's it's something that I think we need to learn how to do, you know, to the best of our ability, put our biases to the side and try to get some, get to know somebody. You might not like them, but that's fine. But you, you learn that, okay, I clearly do not like you because A, B, C, D. Not because I've looked at you and I'm like, eh, you don't look like somebody I would like because that makes absolutely no sense to me, right? So like, you know, telling like things that were like, the concept of like, you know, racism, for me, it's absurd. Like, how can you hate somebody based off the color of the suit? Or like, you know, like, so even like if you take race out of it or like you know sexual identity or things of that nature like how can you hate somebody because of you know who they choose to love it's it's absurd to me because there is there more than that that's my thing like for me i'm gonna speak from the odd perspective there's things about all my friends that i don't necessarily like and, but that's that's normal like you're not going to like everything about everybody i think you know as long as you have you know there's just obviously certain like basis the values, like you know how to treat others, like you know things of that nature, whatever that may look like to you. But you, we need to get to know each other, right? and I think that's one of the big problems that we 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 have right now is we don't get to know each other. You know, we we know our niche of people, which is you know people that you know we grew up around, and we limit ourselves to that. But the world is huge, and that's why you know I'm at the point I'm like you know if you have a chance to travel do it if you can afford it do it because it it just it 
it gives you a different like way of looking at things. It gives you like, and it also makes you feel so much like smaller because we feel like the world is huge, but it's not. It's really not. It's it's so close. Again, like it's, and I haven't been to like as many countries that I I wanted to go. Like I think I've only I've been to what like four countries in Europe, three countries in Africa, and only. China and Asia, but I want like my goal is to like literally I've traveled to every single country because it's like you see how similar we are. It's like you know like when you know if you look up you know portrayal on the media or like you know movies things of that nature of like you know Asians right especially Chinese people like they they put in a box right it's either the the nerd that's really really smart awkward sounding little things of that nature. Or, you know, like, you know, if it's a woman, it's like, you know, she's sexual promiscuous, love cars, things of that nature. And then you go there and you realize, like, I could see my friends into some other people. And I'm like, oh, yeah, that is definitely Cordell. And it's like, it's funny because it's like, we're all the same. We really are. Like, we speak a different language. We sound different. We all have our, you know, our accents and things of that nature. But we all the same. We all the same. We all scared of the same thing. We have, we love food, and you know, we hate vegetables. You know, things of that nature. It's, you know, we we're all the same. We like we're small, and you know, you get to figure those things out once you get to know somebody. And I think it's it's something that's missing out from this whole equation is you know we we don't get to know each other anymore. You'll probably like this one, David. Uh, this is a conversation I had with a colleague of mine, uh, Natalie Butler. She put it as we judge people by ourselves and be it, you know, like the, the stereotyping, like you mentioned, be it sexual preference, racism. Mm-hmm. It comes back to, to, to what do you probably look at, how you've been brought up. Mm-hmm. Uh, and obviously it's kind of, it's a linear effect. It's you're going to pass on how you've been taught, but maybe you should question some of those values in terms of, okay, some people won't ever do that because ultimately they don't want to change. That's fair enough. Obviously you and I would probably not go anywhere near somebody that is, is, is probably racist because it's not, so you've been in the US talking about obviously Black Lives Matter and institutional racism you probably have probably seen it in, in, in stadiums of, 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 yeah, of playing oh yeah, themselves. Absolutely. Absolutely. I've been called the N word in stadiums more times than I can count, to be honest with you. And as sad as it sounds, you get numb to it, which is like, it's something I wish, I wish that wasn't true, but yeah, like, yes, yeah, you can call this thing all the time. Are you serious? It's, it gets, it's, it's like it, it gets to a point where like it starts bothering you and like that starts very young like in high school and like you know obviously the first time you hear it and you're like 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 you like you get pissed off and things of that nature but it gets to a point where you're just like okay like they're going to say whatever and it's it's sad that it gets to that point like the fact that I say that I'm numb to somebody calling me the N word in a sport contest is something that's very freaking sad. And it's, yeah, but that's the reality of it. And like, you know, but to be honest with you, I'm hopeful. I'm hopeful because I've seen people change. I'm hopeful because I've had conversations with people. And like, that's one thing I, I like about living in Texas, like, because, um, one thing about living in the South, right, is, it's going to be more overt than it is going to be like, you know, in other parts of the country. You know, the person's going to be much more political. Great. Like, dude will walk up to you and like literally ask you, like, you know, what is this Black Lives Matter all about? Like, it's all about, about to be all lying. And, like, you engage in conversation. Obviously, depending on uh, the type of person, like how open they are, but even if they don't realize what they're saying is ignorant, I think here, they're much like, they will lay everything out on the table. And one of the people, like, I went to the Black Student Athlete Summit at the University of Texas. And one of the professors that spoke there, that's one of the points that he made. He said he had an offer to go and be a professor at Harvard. And, you know, you know, obviously, you know, as a professor, that's like, that's the holy grail. You know, you get to wear that H on your chest. It's, you know, it's a done deal. But he was like, one of the things why he stayed at Tech, at the University of Texas, because he's able to have those, those he said those conversations 
are much more candid because, you know, you walk in a country club and it's just, you know, something about the culture, which is, it, again, I'm not saying it's supposed to be this way because it's not, but you hear what, they, what they're saying, like, to some extent, are able to have a conversation, as in somebody else that would just not say anything and you don't know how they feel, you don't know how they stand about you and things of that nature, and you're able to, like, you know, uh, have a conversation about that. And that's one of the things I was able to do in my own locker room. Like, one of my really good friends, and we talked about this all the time, we come from very two different, very different background, and like you know, our views on like you know the police from the you know from our the way we were brought up, I've been totally different. But I remember it was last year, like we had a conversation in the locker room, and it was after practice, and music was playing, and people were just being goofy in the locker room. And I, I looked at him, I was like, this would never happen on, you know, on the other side of campus. And he was like, absolutely not. And we just started having a conversation about, you know, why and, like, you know, how, you know, sports are very, like, important to bring people together. Like, he said, he was like, oh, yeah. He was like, one thing for me that changed from the very beginning it, when, when I started playing with you guys and knowing you guys is my view on the police. And I was like, that's interesting. You know, speak more about that. He was like, well, Dave, you need to understand, you know, ever since I was born, I've only seen, like, two people being pulled over. So my whole mindset around the police was like, they're there you know they're they're good guys they're there to serve and you know most of them are right but i was never like you know i've never seen the things that you saw and obviously you know i know you guys i trust you guys like i love you guys and i hear you guys' experience and i hear you know things that were done to you guys and things of that nature and i was like yo like this happens and you know again conversations like that that's the thing it, it, it's conversations and that's how you know his views on they change and again that's one of my um and that's he's one of my really good friends. So to uh, see that you know happen, like I'm really hopeful. And like it's it things obviously it's not a, a long case, right? It's things that happen throughout the country. So yeah, that that definitely gives me hope. So David, yeah, talk to me about becoming the founder of Fades to Grades because ultimately you don't run a fade. Being an offensive yeah. lineman, <laughs> why'd you come up with that concept? Absolutely. Um, basically, fans from grades started from a single like idea is the fact that within a low socioeconomic uh, household, especially, you know, black and brown people, the emphasis have diverged from academia to being about athletics from the most part. Right. So, again, I walk into whether it be like, you know, Walmart, grocery stores, like wherever, movie theaters, things like that. People will see my size and the question they would ask me, you know, what sport you play? And it didn't matter if I told them I didn't play a sport, things of that nature. That's where the conversation was like start and stop. We'll be just all kidding around sport. And it's essentially putting the kid in the box. And the reason for that is obviously in those um, uh, in, in those economic groups, that's the way that they see, you know, their sons or daughter quote-unquote way out, right, way of, you know, bringing themselves out of the situation and bringing the family out of the situation. But then when you look at the numbers of people that are able to essentially, you know, play at the professional league for a substantial amount of time and make, you know, adequate funds not only bring themselves out of that situation, their family out of that situation, it is extremely small. And I say it all the time, is you know, you look at the amount of money that an engineer makes from the time they start to the time they retire on average, it's more than a professional player. Why? Because a professional player is probably going to be a professional for about three years. When you're talking about NFL and NBA. And also the chances of you being a professional is going to be like, you know, 1% or like 0.9%, which is in no aspect of your life will you take those odds. So why is it that we spend so much energy, so much funds going through that? So I was thinking, how do we, change the conversation from being just about athletics, but, you know, bring academia back to the fold. And I'm an avid reader and I love reading. And I remember one day I was reading a book about uh, Martin Luther King and he was just talking about, you know, how they went about strategizing during the civil rights movement. And it was a paragraph in that talked about the barber shopping. How it was like a meeting point where they have meaningful conversations and things of that nature. And I remember I read that and I started laughing. I was like, if I if if MLK only knew the crap that we talked about in the barbershop, he would be highly disappointed into what he's writing to this book. But also the second thing that came up to my mind was like, whoa, if this could have happened in a barbershop and I see what's happening now, 
That means that there was a switch at one point, which everything that's learned, I believe, can be unlearned. And if it happened before, it can happen again. So I was like, okay, so it's definitely a place where, you know, socialization happened. If you, you know, anything about uh, black and brown people and their barbers, it's, it's one of the few things that we're fully faithful to. So like a person would very rarely, very rarely switch their barbers. Like unless the barber dies or you move very, very far away, you're not going to switch a barber. So that tells me that's this trust right there. With trust, that's a big aspect of socialization. Okay. Then next thing that I did was, you know, I interviewed barbers, you know, how do you see your role? Do you see yourself as like a leadership role, things of that nature, just a different question there. And that's when I found out, yes, they see themselves as leadership role. Because again, they've been cutting the same dude's head from the time he's four years old to now he's a grown man at 31 years old. Yes, he's invested in the kid. Yes, he wants that kid to see himself. I was like, okay, so he sees himself as a leadership role. And as a parent, how do you see the barber? How often do you go to the barber? And we realized that, okay, it's there enough of time, obviously for a long period of time, for, you know, all those, uh, all those aspects of socialization to kick in and, you know, to really um, entice different aspects of the child. So that's what the idea of Fitness for Brands was about, was to find a way that obviously find, uh, make the barbershop a place where um, conversation about academia rises, like, you know, more. But obviously, how do you stimulate that from a barber's perspective? there needs to be influx of money coming in, right? And obviously, as a parent, seeing that, you know, the program is associated with the barber, you're much more inclined to have your kid keep continue to go there and things of that nature, which gives the barber more money, which is even much more enticed to, you know, talk to the kid about academia. And also, as a kid, you are, you are going to go back to the barber because, again, you're not going to switch your barber. And then, B, the barbershop has always been a place where vulnerability happens, right? So if I had a bad game, I, I know I... I had to get a haircut. Like, you can't just show up and not have a haircut. So, either way, I was going to have, and I knew I was going to hear, and, you know, that pushed me to, you know, be better in that way. So, that's essentially the whole idea behind Fits for Grades. You can see, you can see even, even I had the bias as a host. I think in sport orientated, I didn't even think of a haircut uh, in terms of a fade. So, there you go. That's, that's, uh, proves your point to, to that little bit of a bias towards conversations being, sports focus that I didn't even think of haircut but obviously moving nicely on to because obviously we will come into the close of the show and I don't want to take yeah. up any too much more of your time David so my penultimate question is and it's very difficult uh, so you like it if you have to sit down with any player I'll stir out even coach in, in irrespective of any sport dead or alive who would that be and why? Ooh, that's a, ooh, that's a tough one. That is a tough one. Okay, I have two answers, two players. The first one is Spencer Dinwiddle of the the point guard of the Brooklyn Nets. The reason for that is, obviously, I follow him on LinkedIn, but I always wanted to meet him, just because, like, I think his values, things that, like, entrepreneur spirit, some things that, you know, identify myself in, and I just, you know, want to pick his brain about, like, you know, how he matches the two, and, you know, I'm very interested into the blockchain technology, not necessarily the crypto aspect of it. I don't necessarily think that's going to work, but just the technology behind it, I find it very innovative. And you no, know, just pick his brain about, you know, like the intersection of, you know, sport, sports and entrepreneur spirit. I just, I found that, you know, very interesting. And I think, you know, like, you know, there's a bunch of players that are doing it right. Like Kevin Durant is doing it right. LeBron James is doing it right. I think he's doing it right. But he's doing it in a very different way. And I think 20 years from now, his value is going, like, people are going to be like, oh, we should have definitely done it this way. Because, what he's, what he's setting himself up for, from a technology standpoint, I don't see any other player doing it. It's, it's very interesting. So definitely be Spencer Newell. The other one would be Jackie Robinson. And the reason for that is, obviously, we know the story. You've seen the movie, you know, the first African-American to play Major League Baseball. And, but I want to understand how. Like, there has to be, and that's the thing, right? You know, 
the sensation, right? So, like, the, the movie is beautifully done, and, like, you know, you hear it, but it's, at the end of the day, he had to go back to his house and look at his wife and was like, okay, like, we're going to come back for one more game. We're going to come back for one season. And I try to put myself in that situation, and obviously that's why, you know, he's Jackie Robinson and what he's able to do for the game of baseball, but just for all sports in the United States. He's just, I want, I want to hear from, like, I want to hear and like, then see the expression in his face of, like, how was he able to do it? Like, what pushed him through? And, like, you know, just, I love conversations. Just, like, understand that because, for me, that's amazing, like, because it's, it's two things. It's obviously he loved the game. And, like, you're an athlete, I'm an athlete. You know how much love you have for, you know, your sport and things of that nature. But to have that much love, but then on, on the on the receiving end, you have so much hate, and it doesn't matter how good. And it's, it's one thing if, like, you're not producing or, like, you're disappointing yourself in your production. Yeah, Because hey, you can understand, you're like, oh, yeah. You hate me. I hate myself too, cause I suck right now, right? But like, it's not that. It's like he was producing, and you have pure hate, and it's like you have to battle the two, and it's it's interesting. And I, I I would love to, you know, just like if I could have, yeah, just have a conversation of how and why, and, cause that's servant leadership, right? And for me, it's you know, I always want to understand you know, how what what push you through, and also like, cause obviously him making that decision to keep playing. It doesn't just affect him, but it affects his wife and his children, right? So how do you, you know, what also make them understand that and accept that burden, right? Because obviously as his wife, she understands that she accepts that burden for not only the cause, but also for her husband. Because she could have said, look here, dude, um, <laughs> this is not for me. <laughs> this is not for me. But she did it. She did not do that. And it's, for me, that's obviously, that's what, you know, those people, like, you know, I, I, legacy is one thing that pushes me. And obviously, you know, their legacy is going to, you know, to the end of the road, this name is always going to resonate. And, you know, that's what it is always going to matter. But I, I want to understand, that, like, how, like, what what creates that aspect of the person. So, yeah, that would be my answer. Especially Dean Widow and Jackie Robinson. And my question, like my final question to you, David, before we wrap up the show then, is if you were to summarize what we've been speaking about today into one sentence for people to take away, what would that be? One sentence? <laughs> oh, that is, that is hard. Talked about a lot. Um, huh. Into one sentence. Into one sentence. Today, we talked about huh. today we talked about the intersection of sports and life. That's what we talked about. The intersection of sports and life and everything that that involves it. I think that's what we talked about today. That that would be my one my one sentence summary. I hope I did well. Well, I appreciate your time and obviously the conversation was was very um, well, it was a great conversation that you and I had. So once again, David, thanks again for coming on the Mindset Athlete Podcast. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks for having me, James. This was great. This was great. I, I love a, I, I'm a sucker for a good conversation. This definitely was one of them. Oh, it's my pleasure. If you like this episode, please do share it with your friends and do let David and I know what you thought of the episode by tagging us over on Instagram at six big puppy two so that's the number six b i g p a p i and the number two and as always at james o roberts 11 so that's j a m e s o r o b e r t s and the number 11 and again this you can do the same on twitter and facebook but obviously for David, it is at 7 big puppy 7 on Twitter. So that is 7, the number 7, B-I-G-P-A-P-I, and the number 7 again. And if you had any additional questions, don't hesitate to shoot them over as well. And finally, don't forget to check him out on Twitter and Instagram. And as always, don't forget to check out my free content at fit.com. 
amputee.co.uk and click on the tab resources. But not forgetting, I've also started up a new Facebook group, especially for the podcast, which you can find by typing in The Mindset Athlete. And last but not least, and not forgetting, I've also rebranded my other Facebook group to adapt, master, and improve your exercise and diet to help you lose 10 pounds plus. So make sure to check those links out. It will be in the description. You can find all the show notes at mindsetgame.lipson.com under the category general. So once again, thanks for listening. And I'll catch you next week for another episode of the Mindset Athlete Podcast.